In this course for the Biological Foundation, we're going to focus heavily on the human nervous system. You can think of our nervous system as allowing one part of your body to communicate with another part of your body fairly rapidly so that you can walk in a coordinated fashion, so that you can type on your cell phone, so that you can think and reason and do all of those activities that are part of your daily life. You'll also read in your textbook about the endocrine system and you can think of that as a typically, not always, slower means of communication as hormones flow through your bloodstream and allow one part of your body to send a message to another part of your body. I'm not going to give you specific detailed quiz questions about the endocrine system. However, I do want you to be familiar with it and make sure you read your textbook. Here our focus is on the human nervous system and I've put a diagram of the human nervous system into your PowerPoint presentation and I want you to know this diagram. First of all, NS, I'm sure you can guess, represents nervous system and the human nervous system is divided into two parts, the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. And you may already know that the central nervous system is composed of the brain and spinal cord. We'll talk about those in much more detail later. But right now, peripheral nervous system is divided into the somatic and autonomic nervous systems, while the autonomic nervous system is divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. So make sure you know this diagram, and we'll be talking about the different parts of the human nervous system in detail. First, let's talk about the peripheral nervous system, the PNS. Again, the peripheral nervous system is composed of the somatic and autonomic nervous systems. The somatic nervous system innervates your skeletal muscles, basically your arms and your legs. These are the neural processes that control your limb movement. In contrast, the autonomic nervous system innervates your visceral muscles and glands. These are the muscles of your heart, your blood vessels, your digestive system. And many years ago, Scientists spoke of the somatic nervous system as being under voluntary control. That makes sense because you can voluntarily move your arms, your legs. They also spoke of the autonomic nervous system as being under involuntary control, meaning you don't have to go through your daily life commanding internally your heart to beat or your blood pressure to be a certain level. But it turns out that this distinction between voluntary and involuntary control is not accurate. We know this because of biofeedback studies. Basically, if you give someone feedback about the rate of their heartbeat, they can learn to speed it up or slow it down. When I was working as a research consultant for a March of Dimes project at Cornell Medical Center in New York City, I got to know the technicians who repaired the equipment and I got to play with one of these instruments and it was great. I got to place electrodes on myself and I could hear a sound that occurred simultaneously with my heartbeat. And it was very easy to be able to speed it up or slow it down just because I had biofeedback. Some medical practitioners today provide biofeedback methods for people to learn to control their stress levels or their blood pressure and it can be highly effective. In a classic psychological study published years ago, laboratory rats were trained through biofeedback and reinforcement to change the blood pressure in their ears. So that for some rats, the right ear would turn bright red and for other rats, it would be the left ear. But clearly biofeedback works with both humans and non-humans. And it is why we no longer say that the somatic nervous system is voluntary while the autonomic nervous system is under involuntary control. Now let's talk about the autonomic nervous system. I said that the autonomic nervous system is composed of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. And I've shown you on the PowerPoint that these two parts of our nervous system have antagonistic or opposite effects. Together, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems innervate every muscle and gland in your body, your stomach muscles, your heart muscles, the muscles of your blood vessels, and so forth. And these two parts of the autonomic nervous system have antagonistic or opposite effects. Imagine that you're walking down the street at night, street lights are broken, and it's very dark, and you suddenly hear footsteps behind you. 
then you stop and you listen carefully but the footsteps stop and then you begin walking again and those footsteps start right back up this is a moment where you're going to be experiencing maybe a strong emotion you may be afraid and I hope you're cautious but under these circumstances your sympathetic nervous system is dominant over your parasympathetic nervous system and when the sympathetic nervous system is dominant your heart rate speeds up your breathing rate speeds up and your digestive system slow down why would you waste energy digesting your food if you may have to fight for your life or run for your life in contrast the parasympathetic nervous system is dominant under times when we're not stressed when we're relaxed and hopefully that's most of the time for you when the parasympathetic nervous system is dominant your breathing rate is slower your heartbeat is slower and your body will expend energy digesting your food so again the peripheral nervous system is composed of the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system the autonomic nervous system is composed of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems so let's move on to the central nervous system we're going to be talking about the brain and the spinal cord a little bit now but we're going to come back to it later on and talk about it in much more detail so the central nervous system is composed of the brain and the spinal cord and those organs are absolutely essential for our survival and as you can imagine they are very much protected within our bodies the brain is encased in a bony skull for protection and your spinal cord is encased in a bony column of vertebrae and they're not just bouncing around loose in those bony structures they're held in place by a series of membranes those membranes are called meninges they are also surrounded by a fluid a clear fluid similar to blood plasma called cerebrospinal fluid so I'm going to talk about the brain first in some graphic terms speed ahead if if you get queasy easily but I actually want you to imagine that someone is undergoing brain surgery or an autopsy is occurring and I want you to think about the human brain for a moment in order to access the human brain you need to saw through the skull and when you lift that piece of bone away what are you seeing are you seeing the brain no you're seeing the series of meninges some of these are thick and rubbery others are soft and cushiony and they all work together to protect the brain within the skull when you peel back those membranes or, or meninges now you're looking down at the surface of a human brain what color is it it's kind of a pinkish gray color is it wet or dry looking it's it's moist looking because it's surrounded by the cerebral spinal fluid which provides nutrients and removes waste products if I were to actually remove a brain from the skull and hold it in my hands it would weigh about three pounds it's not that heavy for something that's so vital to our existence and the size of the brain is not correlated with intelligence scores you should understand the word correlation now but what I'm saying is that you cannot look at the mass of some or size of someone's brain and predict their degree of intelligence another thing to notice about the human brain is that it's very fragile and delicate looking it's easily misshapen by gravity and finally if we put our imaginary brain down on a table and step back and look at it you'll notice that it's composed of two halves that are each a mirror image of the other these are the two hemispheres of the brain and we say that they have bilateral symmetry bi meaning two and lateral meaning side and like the rest of our body the brain does seem to have one half that is the mirror image of the other half bilateral symmetry again we're going to come back and talk in much more detail about the brain but first I want to talk a little bit about the spinal cord and how it functions 